All right. Well, once again, welcome to AP Academy Professional Development Series. This is our second uh, workshop in this series. We're really excited that y'all are joining us today, and we may have a few more join us as we get started. Um, my name is Allie Michael. For those of you that don't know me, I'm the coordinator for academic services and engagement. Uh, we also have from our office on here today, we have our director, Dr. Ashley Spearman, um, and also our office supervisor, Rachel Carroll, um, is with us today as well. They're, they're going to help me with uh, managing the chat box as we talk today. And then we have our wonderful presenter with us who I am always so thrilled to listen to. I learn something new every time she presents. Um, this is Dr. Amanda Warnhoff. She is the Director of Institutional Effectiveness and Assessment, right? Yes, <laughs> we have very long titles here. Um, so this is going to be a, an interactive session today, I believe. So please feel free to uh, contribute, to talk, to ask questions, all of that good stuff. We will be posting this link, the recorded uh, link to our website. So if you wanna come back, if you forget something and you wanna come back and watch it again, it will be available uh, once we get that cloud recording. So Dr. Warnhoff, I'm gonna hand it over to you. Great, thank you, Allie and everybody. I'm very happy to be here on this Friday. Um, so as, as Allie said, I'm the director of IEA. I'm relatively new to Austin P. I, I got here um, in May. It seems like a really long time ago, but it was just in May. And um, prior to being a full-time administrator, I was in the classroom. I was a, an English instructor. I taught primarily um, first and second year writing to undergraduates occasionally supervise some graduate students. Um, so my presentation today, I mentioned that because it really comes from that point of view. So I'm here as the director of IEA, but as a writing instructor, reflection is a really serious part of our pedagogy. Um, so it's something that I'm certainly not an expert, but it's something that I did for many years with many students to varying degrees of success. <laughs> so partially today is um, lessons learned, but I've also, seen among the assessment community that I'm now a part of a, a resurgence, I would say, in interest in reflection and using reflection for assessment of student learning because of the world we're all living in at this moment. Um, I think it's always been a great accepted practice for assessment of student learning, both at the course level, activity level, program level, whatever. Um, but you know, it always kind of took second chair to what we call direct assessment, you know, looking at a student project or a student paper or a student performance and evaluating it. The reflection that a student would do about themselves or their experience was always seen as kind of secondary to that. And that is still true, I would say, but I, I, I'm seeing a bigger conversation about the value of this type of activity and, and trying to make it more of a rigorous assessment, which is something I have struggled with throughout my career. Um, you know, when I first started teaching writing, it was like, I'm just going to ask them to free write about their thoughts on whatever, right? Which is a great activity, um, but it always doesn't turn out great. You've got the student that writes one sentence. Uh, you've got the student who doesn't take it seriously and writes kind of snarky stuff, right? <laughs> um, and then you have the students who are, are very free, like deep thinkers who want to write 20 pages, right? So it's all over the map. Um, and as somebody who really loves structure, um, it took me a long time to kind of come to a, some kind of happy medium between giving them the freedom that I wanted them to have to reflect on themselves and their learning experiences, while also making it a valuable assessment for me of where they are, what they've learned, what I can do with that information. I always learn something from student reflection even the ones that are one sentences, right? Because what I learn about you is you're, you, you might be uncomfortable engaging in this, right? So that I, that's valuable. But in terms of what I can actually use to improve my course design and what I can use to improve the way I design assessments and, and what students are taking from it, I want it to be valuable for them. So. I've done different you know, versions over the years, but today I, I had planned on doing this anyway today, talking about reflection. And I really wanna hear from some of you about the, how successful or not that's been for you in your courses. 
but I also just recently attended a presentation that um, came about about using self-reflective writing for assessment of student learning that was fantastic. And I'm gonna put some of that in my presentation today. And I will ask um, Allie and Dr. Spearman to share the slides from that presentation with you because the, the two individuals that led it are actually do pretty significant research on using self-reflection as assessment. And they have some really great articles and free workshops. One of the best things about the pandemic is all this accessible free professional developments out there. Um, and they are putting on some really great stuff. So that will be part of what I'm showing you today. So I'm going to go ahead and um, share my screen. Okay. Let's see, I don't like this. Hold on a sec. Allie, are you guys seeing the right thing now? Are you seeing the, okay, just want to make sure. Um, so our office does a lot of different things here at Austin P. Um, we focus on the outcomes assessment process, which my presentation workshop today is kind of situated within that. We focus mostly on that at the program level, but for this academy and the workshops I do with faculty, I try to focus on um, course level assessment, things that you would use in your actual course. Um, and our job is really to facilitate that process at the course level, program level, institutional level, and to use that data to do something useful and to help you use that data to do something useful for your future. So who doesn't love a John Dewey quote, right? Um, and I've come to learn that this isn't really, as many quotes on the internet are, isn't really the quote, right? Like it's more of a paraphrase, but still, it's a good thought. We do not learn from experience, we learn from reflecting on that experience. So we can do things, we can participate in things, but if we don't sit and think about it and really interrogate it in our own minds, we're not gonna take much from it. Um, and that's, that's really, sort of the, the backbone of why we wanna use reflection in our teaching, which I'm sure many of you already do. So I wanted to situate this in the broader cycle of assessment. So any of us, whether we run a program, we run an office, or we're teaching a course, we decide what we want the outcome of that course to be for students, we plan the way we plan to assess whether they're doing those things or not, we collect that information, we look at it, we think about it, we try to maybe make some improvements for the next time we teach that course or do that program. Um, that cycle, we call it the assessment cycle, but really it's the teaching cycle. There are a lot of other things that happen in between there, right, that we do as, as instructors, but this is the basic cycle in which we're situating the thoughts about reflection. So just as a reminder, if any of you were uh, part of the the sort of prep um, for the semester, I presented on kind of our expectations for you as instructors at the course level. And that is that you'll identify your learning outcomes, whether those are dictated to you by the program that you are teaching for, or whether you design your own, that you'll include those on your syllabus. And then of course, the two things that we're really focusing on today, that you'll align what you're doing in your course, your course design, your assessments, your activities, with those things you hope students get out of the course, and then you will use those things to assess student learning and make improvements in real time and also maybe the next time that you teach that course or another course. So we want to articulate the knowledge, skills, behaviors, attitudes, values that students are getting out of our course. Again, if you're teaching for a program that defines those for you, you may already have them. Um, if you don't, if they give you more freedom to design your own or you got to add a couple of your own outcomes, you may have already done that. And those student learning outcomes, you know, for a regular three credit course, there's usually three to five, and you're taking those really big things, right, that you just hope every student walks away from that course with, and then you work backwards and try to design everything else you're gonna do for eight weeks or 16 weeks. It is a tough job. Then you wanna include those on your syllabus, right, and communicate those to your students. That's your next, make sure that people know what you're trying to teach them, right? That's, that's kind of a basic, basic idea. And then what we're really focusing on today is that course design element. So of course you're already teaching a course that's already designed. 
But the great thing about reflection is that you can kind of throw it in there at any point. So that's kind of what I wanted to think about today. You know, we're in week, I don't know, you all know better than me, but I feel like we're in week, what, four or five or something? Five, I was close. Um, week five, and as we approach midterm, this is a really good time to think about how could I embed some of these little snippets of, of reflection or even do something bigger in the second two thirds of the semester that tells me more about where students are and what they're learning, especially if you're teaching online or in some kind of high flex environment and you have students that you're never seeing. This can be a good way to do that. Um, if you can creatively kind of engage them in, the, in that activity. I know that can be hard in the online environment. So you're planning this, you're building it. Sometimes, as they say, we're building the plane while we're flying it, which is mostly what teaching is, in my opinion. Um, so you may be, especially in this environment, kind of flipping things around as you go. Um, but you're, you're planning the best you can. So then after it's all over, whether that's maybe some one thing, a paper, a test, or a presentation, or maybe the whole course, you look at the whole picture. Whether you do this formally or not, we all do it informally, right? You say, well, oh, everybody's paper had blah, 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 that didn't go very well. Or wow, they all really seem to, you know, ace these five questions on the exam, but they struggled with this one. We think about that and then we say, what do we need to do differently? in the next lesson or in the next course to make that better for us and for them. So today we really want to think about reflection as assessment. So depending on what discipline you come from, depending on how you like to teach your courses, depending on the time you have as a human, um, you might have zero reflection in your course. You might have informal reflection in your course where maybe you just are having a one-on-one -on -one meeting with a student and you say, how did that go? Um, or you might have more really formal reflection activities where you have a reflection paper that you ask students to do or a presentation or something like that um, or a worksheet, these kinds of things. Um, but the important thing to remember is how, I was reminded of this in the, in the activities I've done lately, of how important these things are, that how easy it can be to kind of maybe take those out of the rotation because they're hard to grade, they're subjective, um, maybe we feel like they're not rigorous enough, but they really are valuable. The research consistently shows that, that students really, their, their learning can be enhanced and deepened by those activities. This term culturally, culturally relevant, I really like, and these are the individuals who uh, I mentioned earlier who are doing some work in this area. You may have heard about culturally responsive. They're kind of pushing it to culturally relevant. Um, and they, you can read their work to tell you more about that. But what they have really found and what they're promoting that I really feel strongly about is that reflection allows student voices into the mix that might not other, otherwise get there through traditional reflection, I mean, traditional assessment methods. Um, whether that's a paper or a test or some kind of other project you ask students to do, reflection can be a really important way to just show that you're trying to have an inclusive environment and to get diverse kinds of learners to participate in the assessment methods. Um, and it gives you really rich information about the students in your course and where they're coming from and how they learn. And what can be overwhelming about that is that you have a lot of students and they all have very specific complex needs and you can think, what if I find out all this stuff and then I don't know what to do about any of it and I can't tailor my course to fit every individual. That's true, but I think you'll probably see some trends in these reflections that you get that help you at least try to address some of them. Again, it's, it's about making the attempt and showing you're making the attempt that really helps students feel included and welcomed and like, like their experience is valued in your classroom. So that's a really useful tool for reflection. Um, and then thirdly, it gives you really unique and distinct data to improve your teaching practice and your course design. You'll find out things through reflection that you wouldn't find out if you just knew that 80% of your class, you know, missed questions three and seven. You won't know why, but maybe if you read reflections on how they prepared and how they felt about the test afterward, 
you find out, oh, they didn't know they were supposed to look at this, or they very much misunderstood my lesson on X. Um, and that can help kind of supplement the more quantitative data you might have from other areas. So this is a huge bucket when I say reflection. And I think some of the things that I think of as reflection, other people wouldn't think of as reflection. So this is really just a disclaimer to, to say, I'm using this as a catch-all term for anything really that, that brings students and their voices and their experience into the assessment or the content. Um, and these are four big buckets of things that I consider reflection that are kind of out there. So metacognition, you know, thinking about your own thinking, thinking about yourself as a learner. I would put in that bucket um, reflection on steps I took, things I studied, things I struggled to study, you know, all that kinds of stuff. Um, self-reflection, I'm thinking more, I mean, all of these are really self-reflection, but this is more really truly personal um, about me in my experience. So a lot of times in my writing classes, I'll, you know, day one ask students to free write about their experiences with writing um, and, you know, what they've been told about themselves in terms of how they're, or what kinds of writers they are. Um, or it might be something about their own experience that's relevant to your course or your program. Uh, integrated learning is kind of that broad term that's out there, integrative learning, where students are taking any kind of content that they've learned in your course and they're merging it across context, their own life, the world, other courses that they have, that the content in the course that you're teaching them isn't isolated. They are, they are actually, you're asking them to mix that with their own lives or other people's lives in the world. Um, and then lastly, goal setting. We often think of reflection as looking back um, or looking at the present, but it's often looking at the future too. Um, what do I wanna be? Where do I wanna go? What should the world look like if we X, Y, Z? You know, kind of thinking, thinking ahead can also be a form of reflection. So this is just more about what I said, um, but the metacognition often shows up as like a pre or post reflection or even during on a learning process or activity, um, you know, before an exam, after an exam, at the beginning of the course, at the end of a course, um, thinking about their learning. Integrated learning, like we said, may helps people make, make connections across contexts um, and goal setting. Who, who, where do I want to go? What do I want to do? What do I want the world to be? What do I want my impact on the world to be? So I want to pause here and if you are willing to share, if you want to drop it in the chat, um, what kinds of reflection activities have you used? What, what do you do or what have you done in the past? Um, and maybe a little bit about how that goes. Well, I can say something. Please do. Uh, in writing class, particularly in writing research papers, I've had them write a I search paper about how they did their research or what goals they had for their research. And the students sometimes have trouble about, well, what, am, what do you want me to tell you about my subject? And I don't want you to tell me anything about your subject. I want you to tell me about how you do the process. And sometimes that works and others are puzzled by it. Yeah, I, I like that because what you just described is, I think, a common tension with students. It's like, well, what do you want me to... Yes. What do you want me to tell you about the topic you asked me to pick or, you know, what, and we're like, no, we're, we're saying, what are your steps? Mm -hmm. And that, that can be a big hurdle with using reflection is just getting them to understand what it is we're asking yes. them to do, which I think also reinforces that we need it. If, if students aren't being taught or individuals, they're not, you know, yes. all fresh out of high school, aren't being taught to think in this way it seems like we need to try to get them to do that. Well, I even heard in a graduate class years ago 
the professor told me that many graduate students aren't much better at it. They still want, well, what do you want me to tell you rather than what did you get out of this? How did you approach this? So it's a common thing. It's not, it's not unique to any students or any group of people. Agreed. Even in professional context, you know, as yes, a supervisor, absolutely. sometimes when you ask your employees to reflect, it's a challenge sometimes. Absolutely. Any other examples, Ashley? Um, I can share. I have no teaching background, um, and I'm only teaching APSC 1000. Um, I currently serve as an academic advisor on campus. But I, for the first time, I'm doing a Zoom class, so that has been interesting. And I use Google Forms or Google Docs a lot um, with my students. And I wouldn't really call them like exit surveys, but a lot of times I have some type of Google Form that's only a few questions um, that were, are more reflective to see how they're making connections of the content and class to themselves. And they usually feel more receptive to put their own little form versus speaking in class or putting it in the chat. So that's been working really well. Um, and given, you know, our pandemic and certain circumstances, I'm a little bit more lenient to offer more extra credit <laughs> opportunities. And some of those are more so reflection activities as well, where I'm focusing less on a grade for something and more so can I actually see that you're understanding the material and applying it and making meaning out of what we're discussing. Um, so those are just a few activities that I've done that have been helpful in uh, moving students forward with the learning process. Yeah, I mean, that's a great example. Quick Google form, they can do it, send it right to you. That's, that's a way that it can be easy for you and for them that isn't, you know, as formal as some other ways we might do it. Mm -hmm. and, especially, and I love the data aspect. If you use Google yeah. Forms, it, I mean, all the data is right there, so you don't have to compile it anymore. Yeah. So. Love that. Yeah, it's great. Any other examples before we move? On? I was just going to say, not oh, yeah, so much yeah. course mechanism, but in some of our co-curricular offerings, we we, tr we really try to facilitate a reflection exercise uh, to first of all got, gather our, our data, uh, but to really understand what's their perception of the activity, especially when we have something that's a, a volunteerism or engagement opportunity, or uh, if we do an, a cultural immersion. I want to make sure that they're getting out of it what we thought they were going to get out of it. And of course, we get some other insights from that as well. It's very rich and valuable. Yeah, I mean, that's a really useful thing to bring up the co-curricular part of it, because one of the primary places reflection is used to, as maybe the primary assessment mode, is when we're asking students to engage in activities, whether that's Oh, I required you to go to this event, or maybe it's you're doing a practicum, right? And I'm in the field and I'm doing the thing. That reflection is the tool that kind of connects what's going on in the class with what they might be doing co-curricular wise. So I, I think it's it's almost imperative that we do it in those contexts. Dr. Spearman, were you gonna say something earlier? Well, I was thinking. For my classes, I am generally really big on reflection. We do a lot of discussion posts and small group things, but I try to respond back individually to as many students as I can to get them to kind of think and engage. And so I try different things. Um, so I like that you actually had self-reflection on there because I really had not actually thought about self-reflection. So the course that I'm currently teaching now is a marketing course of how to brand yourself getting into the workforce. And so I try to do a lot of activities that have them thinking practically about for the future. Um, obviously right now, their future looks a little different with COVID. And so we've been trying to think outside of the box and ways to keep them engaged. And so basically my class is via Zoom most of the time. But even for, um, you can ask my staff, they may get on their nerves, but I'm a big after action person. So after we do projects, I like to have an, <laughs> they're all shaking their head. Um, I really would love an after action report after everything we do, but I don't, I'm trying not to be that anal, but um, out of huge events, I love the data. And so I was just thinking like, oh, AJ might be right. We might need to start using Google Docs a little bit more, but loving having data to, um, 
back up some of our feelings, but that even like for the office, because we do so many different things that it just, the next week could be completely lost and gone. And so if you don't have that, we've incorporated that because of the QEP, um, maybe that's how my brain works, but we were required. So especially for study abroad and service learning and, you know, research, et cetera, et cetera, we had that built in. And so that's just the way that I think, and that's been a valuable resource, especially right now, we are writing our annual report, um, well, from last year, but we're writing our annual report. And so much of our annual report is that reflection of thinking back and having like spotlights or statements from faculty and from students, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that the past couple of years, I've, I've seen how that makes the difference for my students um, and for the projects and even our office and programming and resources that kind of has that student perspective that has nothing to do with the tests or you know, getting in the, out of the mind frame of giving us the answer that they want us to have has been really invaluable for moving forward for the future and for programming and how we continue to program. So um, I've drunk the Kool-Aid, Dr. Warnhoff, so. Great. Well, and I think that point about self-reflection that a lot of times reflection, rightfully so, is kind of practically focused, right? Like what do we want to be as professionals? What did we learn from the content? Um, but especially now, but always really, if, you, if you're so inclined and depending on how comfortable you are as a faculty member with this, you know, asking students to self-reflect just about where they are and what's going on with them in a, in a private way maybe that only you see can be really helpful. You know, if you reach midterm and you say, okay, let's just, I'm going to ask you to write me a one page about how things are going for you what you see the rest of the semester looking like. And not everybody's gonna be comfortable doing that with their students, but if you are, it can be really eye-opening. You, you just might need to be prepared um, to connect that student with resources, right? So you wanna be ready to do that. But it can be really, it can be helpful for you too to take a breath and say like, we're all human, let's reflect on that for a minute um, instead of getting bogged down by what you absolutely have to do, for sure. Well, thank you, everybody. All right. Um, so I'm, I'm going to really focus for this moment on metacognition and integrated learning, or what I'm calling those things, and just talk through a few examples of those. Some of you are, have just discussed those. Um, so again, a pre-post reflection on a course or activity, there are lots of ways to do that. Um, so we at my prior institution had an experiential learning requirement where every student had to take two experiential learning courses. Um, and anytime a faculty member taught that class, they were required to have students do a pre-reflection on what they thought they would get out of this experience and how applicable it would be to their learning and their career. And then they had to do a post-reflection at the end as well. And that can be really helpful for you to see growth um, over a course or an activity too. You know, if it's like, oh, we're going to be doing this project on X, maybe do a pre on what students think they'll get out of it, and then a post on what they thought they got, you know, what they really got out of it. Um, exam wrappers are something I've mentioned before, and we do have some resources on um, the website about this. So these can take different forms, but they, there's actually worksheets out there um, that students can fill out before an exam or even just after to say how they prepared or how they plan to prepare. And then afterward, they kind of reflect on that and think about, well, what went well, what didn't, what might I do in my study um, process next time? And it helped, if, you look, if you're looking at those, that can help you know how to embed maybe some of those study activities into your class. Reflection on feedback is one we use in writing a lot. Um, but it's really, it's applicable to, I think, a lot of different contexts. If you've graded something for a student, especially something that might be leading into another step or into a final project, and you've given them feedback or you've completed a rubric, asking them to reflect on what you asked them to change or do for next time is, can be helpful. I actually have a great worksheet on that. If you're interested, I can share it. Um, that actually a grad student I worked with designed that we use for conferences. So we had students look at the feedback, reflect on it, have the conference, and then reflect on what they were gonna do. So it was kind of a multi-step process that, that she was really responsible for, but it was great. 
many of you might work in disciplines where students are compiling a portfolio. Um, and this is where they're curating their own work, right? Like maybe they look at the learning outcomes and they select a few assignments that they think reflect that. And then they discuss that in a re reflective sort of cover sheet for their portfolio. Group work reflection is another good one that I've used to varying degrees of success. And I have some examples from colleagues that I'm happy to share. That is, you know, group work's always challenging, right? Because how do you know who did what and everybody hates it and blah, blah, blah. Um, but I, there's some good examples out there of asking students to do individual reflections on their contributions to the group, as well as challenges that their group faced that can be very illustrative to you. <laughs> um, because they might be willing to say things in that reflection. And, you know, I truthfully find, especially in those group work ones, the students are actually pretty honest about their contributions to the group. Um, rarely do I find they overstate it. And, and they're actually kinder and gentler with their, front, with their um, group mates than you would think, but they are pretty honest about it. So the group work reflection can be a really good one to get sort of an individual picture of what's going on in a group. Integrated learning is a, is a big thing, um, but I, I wanted to say that it, it doesn't always have to be papers. So we often think of reflection as writing or reflective papers. It doesn't always have to be that. Um, we, in one of our student success courses, had a course on mission, um, and it was an online course, and we asked students to view content and then write a reflection paper on their relationship to the mission. Those weren't great. Um, so we decided to change that into a quiz. So it was a quiz, but with reflective questions. Um, and we got much better responses to that because what we found was that in the essay, students struggled to address all the things we wanted them to address or they kind of forgot one part or they got distracted by something or it turned into something we didn't really intend. Um, and so this asked them to focus on really specific items that we wanted them to reflect on. And for whatever reason, that mode worked better for them or it could be even a survey to some degree. We did that with some in our success course with some presentations from like we had financial aid come in and do a presentation and then we would give them a survey that was not just like how much did you like it it was a survey that asked them to reflect on what they were going to do now um, and that was helpful too so it could be more of a survey type item and thinking about reading reflections again i find that students reflect better when they have something to reflect on so if you're assigning a reading, you're assigning a video, you're maybe even after a lecture, asking them to do a reflection on that that incorporates some bit of content from that course material with their own life or experience, it, it gives them something to bounce off of. And this is something I've done at the doctoral level. This works at multiple levels, asking students to reflect on content. You know, Ashley kind of brought this up, kind of reflecting on something from class and maybe your professional experience. That's a way to kind of bring it, bring it together. These can be test questions. This is what I want to enforce. <laughs> so it reinforces. If you are giving exams in your class, as many of us do, you can have reflective questions on that exam. It doesn't have to be a whole separate process. So maybe students are doing some multiple choice stuff and then at the end, you ask some reflective questions, either about their preparation for the exam or you could ask them what we just discussed, connecting content to some real world issue or where do you see this concept show up in whatever profession or field or your life. Um, those kinds of questions can help you also avoid the whole, are they cheating? Um, question, right? Because those are things where you're asking them to bring in their own personal ideas. And presentations can be easier on you. So instead of grading writing, ask them, that could be an informal thing where you, you know, ask them to just sort of give a little five minute presentation on something. Maybe they read something and now they're going to reflect on how it relates to them. It could be something more formal. I've done things where students have to give a presentation at the end of a course um on how that course related to their life and what they intend to do with it in the future um or it could just be about their own personal growth over the course depending on how you want to put that together 
but they, it doesn't all have to be in writing. This is what I'm trying to suggest. So this is part of um, that other presentation, and I, I don't want to go down this hole too much, but they do a really great job. Um, so Karen Singer Freeman and Linda Bastone have done research on this, and they, they really focus on a rigorous use of self-reflective writing for almost like rubric-based assessment. Um, so they are asking students to do these four steps in this reflective writing. Describe a content or process that they have learned. So what, what did they learn? Make them describe it. Evaluate it. Talk about the difference that that learning has made for them or for others. And then integrate and connect that either to their own lives or some other context. And then to plan for the future in some way. And I'll show you a couple of examples of this. And again, we'll share these. These are some questions that you can ask students. This is also really helpful for each of these items. Um, but I want to I want to just show these to you. So this is a good simple example. So this is for introductory biology. So you can see the rubric on the left, right? This is what they would want students to do. Describe two central concepts, clearly explain why those topics are important. On the right, they give you a couple ways that prompts you can give students. So these could be exam questions. So you could be giving students an exam on these introductory concepts and then add a couple of questions at the end that are about describing two important things they learned over this unit or whatever and explaining why those, making them talk about it in their own words is going to give you different data than just do they understand the concepts. And I like this one because it was relatively simple. This is more involved. This is maybe something I would be more used to in a writing course, but I think it has multiple applications. And this is sort of what Jerry was referring to earlier. So where you're asking students to kind of describe their steps, describe their obstacles, um, and then using the rubric to evaluate themselves. So some form of self-evaluation and then planning for improvement. What will they do next time? I like this one because I think a lot of self-evaluation reflection activities are a little open-ended um, or they don't give students enough information on how they're supposed to evaluate themselves. This one kind of breaks it down into four distinct components of the reflection that you expect. And I think that helps a lot. So you would be grading the student's product, the thing that they produced, but then you would also be looking at their self-reflective writing that addresses these four areas, which is going to tell you a lot more than just looking at their finished product. This is just another example. Um, this, I think, would be sort of for an education class um, where students are learning about childhood contexts. But again, I think could apply to anywhere that you're talking about theories that it can apply to someone's life or concepts that could apply to someone's life which should be most things, right, that we're teaching. Um, even if it's like a history class, right? How did this historical event, how does that relate to now? Those kinds of things. Um, so here, first they're describing sort of the, the theories of the, the ecological model. Then they're describing two environments from their own childhood and relating the concepts to that. Then they're saying how they'd behave differently knowing what they know now which I think is really interesting. And then lastly, three things they wish to remember about this topic, which is another thing that I really liked. Um, because often we don't know what students take away and what they even want to take away. So this can be helpful to say, I want you to take this, but it, sometimes they learn things we didn't even intend, right? So they, that's where you can find that out. And again, I like this because it's, you could just say, write about what you learned. But this really gives you those concrete steps and makes it more difficult um, for students to think through these things. And it, it would be a challenge. But once you do it a couple of times, you'll have some good examples that you could use with permission from the students to show students, hey, here's, here's the example of what I want you to do. I think that goes a long way. So a couple of you touched on this. And to me, this is almost more important than what you're asking students to do is how you're asking them to do it. This is something I've played with a lot um, because again, I started with sort of the free write model and that wasn't working for me. So I tried to do a bunch of other things. Um, 
but really thinking about what am I asking students to, to physically do and how will that impact what I get out of them. So if I asked you to write me an essay about how your semester is going so far with teaching, you're going to approach that differently than if I said, I'm going to give you a short quiz on your teaching practice so far. Um, or if I said, I want you to come to this meeting next week and give a five minute presentation on what you've learned about your teaching so far this semester. Those are very different approaches and you would approach those, you would feel differently about doing those things. So doing something that's going to get, give you something meaningful, but that is also accessible to students um, is important, but also, you know, longer isn't better. <laughs> so if you force students to write a three page reflection paper, you might get a lot of fluff. But if you give them a really focused survey or you ask for a two minute speech, you might get more valuable but shorter information. So really just thinking about these considerations. So there's this idea of utility value um, and reflection has very high, the, it has the possibility of very high utility value to learners. And utility value is really broken down into these three areas. The personal value to me, which obviously reflection is very high on that because we're asking people to think and talk about themselves. Academic can be harder. Um, I've seen some really bad examples of reflection, um, some from my own class, but from other contexts where you're like, really, is this what you're asking students to do? You know, like that's not good. Um, so making it academically valuable to them and to, to you is really hard, is really challenging. Um, and that's why I like the way um, the authors of those articles do that. They try to do it in this really rigorous academic way. And then professionally, Dr. Spearman talked about this, right? Like what, what is, what is of use, how is this of use to me as a professional? And that doesn't just mean for your career, right? It could mean how is this just useful to me as a citizen of the world or somebody who's going to go to graduate school or whatever those things are? What is it useful to me when I'm operating in kind of public contexts? And in order for a reflection to have all those values, it has to be carefully designed. And a lot of that's trial and error. But one thing I really wanted you to think about today is all the different ways this could happen. Because I think sometimes we put it into one bucket and think this is what reflection is. Um, or for some of us, it feels a little touchy feely. That's kind of outside of maybe the content driven class that we're teaching, but there's lots of ways this can happen. Um, that's valuable to you and to your students. Public or private is a big one. And um, Someone mentioned this earlier, you know, if it's on the discussion board uh, Online, everybody can see it. Which might be what you want. Right. So it depends on what what it is, but thinking about, do I want this to be something that just I and the student see? Do I want some component of it to be just something the student does? And then what they present publicly in a presentation is maybe something different. So I give them a step where they are doing some kind of free write, and then I ask them to put it together in some professional way that they share publicly. But that's a big consideration. Graded or ungraded? Man, this has been a struggle for me all along. So all the pros and cons of both, right? So ungraded means it's free, you can do what you want and there's no rules and you can take risks. But then maybe they don't do it. Maybe they don't take it seriously, right? Graded, it becomes a higher stakes thing sometimes. And what I found is, and I'm sure many of you, if it's graded, they wanna do what they need to do to get the grade, not really be honestly reflective. I find that I have to have really frank discussions with students in class about, I am not looking for you to kiss my, you know what? I am looking for you to tell the truth about what you've learned and how you felt. And it, it seems silly that just saying that helps, it helps because they really just want to, at the end of the day, get a good grade or please you. And that's not really what you're looking for. Um, so having frank conversations about this, and I think Dr. Spearman mentioned this, kind of normalizing it. Like the more you do it, the more people realize they can be honest and how you respond to it. 
And that relates to your role. What role do you want to play in this? Are you just given points? Maybe that's, maybe that's kind of the happy medium between graded and ungraded, right? They have points for it, but you're not going to criticize it, right? So they, they feel a little more free. Or maybe they'll respond better if everybody gets something back from you. But you really want to think about that going in. What's my role in this and how can I be transparent with students about that? Um, and then lastly, that return on investment, which is always hard, but it's for you and for them. This will take time from you, no matter what. So how can you design something that still gives you some insight into your students that's a little deeper, but that you can actually read <laughs> and have time to listen to? And that's where sometimes presentations come in or something like that. Um, where it might be easier for you to work on your schedule. And for them, if they feel like they're doing something, as you know, that is busy work, it is not gonna, they're either not gonna do it or it's not gonna turn out very well. So kind of incorporating it in a way that is also useful to them with, you know, a reasonable amount of effort. So I, I can share anything you'd like after the meeting, but I, I just, we don't have to discuss this necessarily. I know we're running out of time, but I do, what I would like you to think about as you go into the rest of the semester, because this is something I'll be thinking about, at least with my own office, um, is what is something you're gonna do soon or later in the semester, an assessment or an activity that you could just squeeze in some kind of reflective component if you're not already doing it? Or if you already have one, I'm gonna reflect on reflection, it's a lot of meta, I know. But if you're reflecting on the reflection that you're gonna do, um, what, could, what tweaks could you do? Could you turn it into a short answer quiz? Could you make it a public five minute presentation? Maybe you wanna give extra credit, like someone said earlier, um, whatever you wanna do, but thinking about how you could kind of weave that in so that you can get some deeper information about where students are and, and what they're going through. So I, with that, I will leave it, but I would if you have responses to that question, I'd love to hear it, um, or if you have other thoughts. I really like the uh, example that you show where we can flip some of my, my assessment questions and turn them into reflective questions. Because I think for my students in particular with this course, um, it's important for me to know immediate feedback on the things that we're talking, especially with it being an online course, I'm used to it being on ground. So normally my on ground courses are highly engaging in class. Like I, I definitely love the flip classroom model where you're doing all your reading and all that stuff and I don't wanna waste your time with PowerPoints. You do that on your own time and have our class be as an engaging and impactful and learn from each other because all of the students are different majors and different perspectives. And that's what I've been missing and craving for my class. So I'm probably do, about to start doing an uptick with my Zoom sessions. Um, and I do have quite a few evening or you know adults that work during the day. And so we, we had an evening session last night. So, um, so I think in the assessment and one of my, a lot of my students freaked out in their first test or quiz. So um, I think that would kind of help them knowing that I appreciate their own personal experiences and allow them to incorporate some of their own. I'm all about integ integrative learning. So incorporate some of their own personal experiences into the content that they're actually learning in the class. So I really like that. So I'm gonna go back and look at their next upcoming quiz and see what I can flip. So I thought that was a really great way to do that. Yeah, I really love the idea of having the students self-evaluate using a rubric. Um, I, I'm like AJ, I teach APSU 1000 and then um, the past academic recovery class in the spring, but the idea, like they have their career research paper coming up and these are first time freshman students. So giving them the rubric and teaching them to use that as they're working on an assignment, I think that would actually be really beneficial for freshmen to get used to that, you know, writing to a rubric <laughs> more or less, you know, so that they can do a better job and submit better work. So I love that idea. I think I'm gonna try to incorporate that in some way. 
And, you know, I, sometimes you'll get varying results to that, but you get some valuable things for sure. And one thing I've done, because I had such a hard time getting students to write projects or do projects that aligned with what I was creating them on the rubric, even though I really showed it to them a lot. Um, I started creating like a checklist that they, they actually had to physically check off <laughs> when they turned in something. Um, that was different than, it was almost like a pre-reflection, I guess, of something. But um, yeah, but self-evaluation is a great tool as well. Well, before I leave you, I, I know I've been talking about this presentation that I went to a lot, but they had a great quote that someone said during it that has really stuck with me that I'm going to use in every part of my professional life now, um, which is, and they just kind of set it offhand, that the assessments that we give our students can reinforce the inequities that are also already in higher ed, or they can actually improve those. And man, it couldn't be truer because many of the assessments that we give our students that traditionally we've used are not inclusive and they are not supporting equity. And that's hard for us, those of us that really believe in those things to swallow, but it's true. And if reflection is one way to better those assessments um, and close those equity gaps, there's really no reason we shouldn't be using it. Um, so that really, that really stuck with me, that our choices or our lack of choices, maybe we just do what we've always done, right? It's not helping. And interestingly, they pointed out from the research that uh, reflection, there is no equity gap with reflective assignments. Students perform similarly across demographic groups, which says a lot because that's not true of many assessments. Okay, um, on that note, I just wanted to remind you, so you have many resources at APSU um, for help on an outcomes assessment, course design. One is our office, I'm happy to chat with you at any time. Of course, you have your chairs and assessment coordinators in your departments. D2L is a great resource. They have so many great tools that can help you with all the things that I talked about today in D2L. Um, many of them I don't even know about, so <laughs> they can, they can definitely help with that. And of course, ASE, the wonderful folks who are putting this on for you um, are another great resource. And feel free to reach out to me at any time. If you, if you want examples of any of these things, I can try to dig them up and you can send me an email. I'm happy to do that. Um, or if you have examples you wanna share, we'd love to see them and can put those together with our other resources. So if there's anything you'd be willing to share and let other people use, we would love to see it. Thank you. I appreciated talking with all of you today. Hey, thank you so much, Dr. Warnhoff. And I do want to add that I will, um, she sent me this PowerPoint slide that she used. And so I will be sure to add that to our website along with this video link um, so that you can go back and, and reference that if you would like to. Um, we have like two and a half minutes left. Does anybody have any burning questions for Dr. Warnhoff um, that you would like to ask before we sign off? All right. Well, I think that last quote that you gave, Amanda, I'm like still kind of thinking about that. I feel like we could have an entire session just talking about that one quote. <laughs> so maybe that's something I'll put on the, on the schedule for a for next semester. So, well, thank you all so much. We actually have another um, AP Academy session next Friday. I'll send out an, an email next week with more information about that. It will be with um, David Sanchez, who is our, um, is he the CIO, I believe? Yeah. <laughs> so um, he will be talking with us about uh, cybersecurity, which of course, now that everything is going online and virtual and all of that, those are things that we really need to be mindful of. So um, we'll be same time, same place, 
uh, next, next week. I'll send out that information with the Zoom link um, next week to everybody if you're available to come back. All right, thank you all so much for uh, spending an hour with us today. And thank you so much to Dr. Warnhoff for sharing this uh, with us. And I hope that you all enjoyed and have a wonderful weekend. Thank you. Thank you.